The problems with the Maynard Tate primer led to its elimination from the next model Springfield. The 1861 model Springfield rifled musket would become the most widely used long arm of the Union Army. It would be popular with the Confederates too, when they could get their hands on one. The new model maintained the 58 caliber barrel, but replaced the tape primer with individual percussion caps loaded each time the gun was fired. This percussion system was a bit slower, but much more reliable. The 1861 model also added a rear sight to increase accuracy. The Union soldiers loved their Springfield rifles. The Confederate soldiers had to look elsewhere. The South lacked the industrial power of the North. And once the war began, the federal government stopped allowing Northern gun manufacturers to sell to the Southern states. At the beginning of the war, on April 18, 1861, the Union soldiers based at the Harper's Ferry Armory set it on fire in an effort to prevent it from falling into the hands of the Virginia militia marching toward them. Residents of the town of Harper's Ferry, dependent on that armory for income, put the fire out, saving most of the equipment. The Confederates took all of the equipment required for manufacturing muskets and sent it to Richmond. Early that summer, the Richmond Armory started producing rifles on the Springfield pattern. Though the armory in Richmond would eventually send hundreds of thousands of arms to the Confederate armies, these would primarily be firearms retrieved from battlefields and repaired. The Richmond Armory was never able to produce more than 1,500 rifles in a single month. The Confederacy would need to find arms elsewhere, and soon. The Union and Confederate governments would both need to purchase arms abroad, particularly in the early years of the war, but the rebels figured that out first. In April 1861, the Confederate government sent Captain, later Major, Caleb Hughes to Europe to procure the arms. Hughes worked tirelessly to find sources of arms and ammunition. The Confederacy had no access to international credit, but Hughes was able to purchase arms using King Cotton. Literally millions of pounds of cotton were traded for weapons needed by the Confederacy. In his Rebel War Clerk's Diary, published after the war, Clerk J.B. Jones wrote regarding Hughes and other purchasing agents. August 23rd, 1861. No arms yet of any amount from Europe, though our agent writes that he has a number of manufactories at work. The U.S. agent has engaged the rest. All the world seems to be in the market buying arms. Mr. Dayton, U.S. minister in Paris, has bought 30,000 flintlocks in France, and our agent wants authority to buy some too. He says the French statisticians allege that no greater mortality in battle occurs from the use of the percussion and the rifled musket than from the old smoothbore flintlock. This may be owing to the fact that a shorter range is sought with the latter. But the Confederate government wasn't looking for flintlocks. In directives to purchasing agents working with Hughes, the Secretary of the Confederate Navy wrote, if you can purchase 10,000 good infield rifles, muskets with bayonets, do so at once, without regard to price. Hughes negotiated contracts with the best rifle manufacturers in Great Britain for purchase of the model 1853 British Enfield rifle. Also known as the P-53 Enfield, it would be the primary firearm of the Confederate Army. Almost a million of these rifles would make their way from Britain to America during the war, most bound for the Confederacy. The P-53 Enfield was a 58 caliber percussion ignition rifle. It fired the conical mini ball bullets and was well regarded for its accuracy. That is, most Enfields were well regarded. 
thanks to Hughes's efforts, the Confederacy was able to purchase almost all machine-made Enfields with interchangeable parts. In a May 21, 1861 letter to the Confederate Ordnance Bureau, Hughes wrote that after arriving in London, a very short time sufficed to satisfy that of small arms there were none in the market of the character and quality required. There were muskets to be purchased in any quantity, called by different names. I heard of not a few Enfield rifles. These, when I came to examine them, I found to be, for the most part, worthless. I then made inquiries at the London Armory Company for Enfield rifles to be manufactured by them. This establishment is, in some respects, superior to every other musket manufacturer in the world, and in every respect equal to the government works at Enfield. The rifles at this establishment interchange in every part with the perfect accuracy. The importance of the principle of interchange of parts I need not dwell upon. It is fully recognized by the war departments of every civilized nation. The London Armory Company is the only establishment in Europe except in the government armories that works upon this principle. I propose to take from the company 10,000 Enfield rifles of the latest government pattern with bayonet, scabbard, extra nipple, snap cap, and stopper. The Confederacy became the London Armory Company's number one client. Over 70,000 rifles and 7,000 revolvers would eventually ship from the company to the Confederate buyers though they had to pass the Union blockade ships to get there. As for those other Enfield pattern rifles that Hughes found, the ones he called for the most part worthless, they often ended up on ships bound for the Union. Union agents also purchased many Enfield rifles, but Hughes had locked in the contract with the London Armory. The Enfields the Union purchased were generally made by smaller outfits, which assembled the rifles using parts from various smaller manufacturers. The parts were not always uniform, which led to the Enfields getting a bad reputation with some Union units. John Meade Gould of Maine wrote, On October 21st, muskets were delivered to the men, and this furnished another excuse for a hearty growl from the first Mainers. Had we not been promised a new blue uniform in Springfield muskets? To be sure, we had the blue uniform, but look at these Enfield muskets with their blued barrels and wood that no man can name. They were not a bad weapon, however, differing little from the Springfield in actual efficiency, weight, length, and caliber, but far behind in point of workmanship. Gould's regiment were more fortunate than some. The Enfields provided to the 35th Massachusetts Infantry were actually defective. The nipples on the fire mechanism were brittle and shattered when hit by the gun's hammer. But the rifles were used throughout the Confederacy and proved themselves reliable weapons. The next most commonly imported firearm was the Austrian Lorenz. Originally a 54 caliber gun, it was often rebored to 58 caliber. Well regarded in Europe, the Lorenz was snapped up by Union and Confederate purchasing agents scouring Europe for arms. Over 225,000 were purchased by the Union and 100,000 by the Confederacy. Leander Stilwell, a soldier with the 61st Illinois Volunteer Infantry, wrote, We were furnished with the Austrian rifle musket. He was of medium length with a light brown walnut stock and was a wicked shooter. At that time, the most of the Western troops were armed with foreign-made muskets imported from Europe. Many regiments had old Belgian muskets, a heavy, cumbersome piece and awkward and unsatisfactory in every way. We were glad to get the Austrians and were quite proud of them. We used these until June 1863, when we turned them in and drew in lieu thereof the Springfield rifle musket of the model 1863. It was not as heavy as the Austrian, was neater looking and a very efficient firearm. Loading and cleaning firearms in the field could be a difficult and hazardous affair. The wide variety of weapons, calibers, firing mechanisms, and ammunition didn't make it any easier. John Meade Gould of Maine described how men in his regiment loaded their weapons. 
In our regiment, we had the combustible envelope cartridge manufactured by Johnson and Dow in New York, which is put in the musket entire without tearing the paper. Consequently, our fire was rapid compared with what was common with the muzzle loader. Some of the men say that they loaded by dropping the cartridge and bring the musket smartly to the ground and the shock would send the cartridge home. But the process varied across weapons and units. The buildup of black powder which fouled the rifles was a constant problem. One solution was the development of cleaner bullets. Developed by Elijah Williams, these had a thin zinc disc attached to the base of the bullet. When the gun fired, the zinc disc scraped along the bore. The first rounds were issued to Union troops in 1862. The Model 1861 Springfield was updated in 1863. Minor improvements were made to this already reliable rifled musket, including new oval clamping bands, a new ramrod, and a case-hardened lock. John Mead Gould's regiment received the upgraded Springfields in January 1864. We had the 1863 pattern of the Springfield rifled musket, muzzle loading as almost all the arms of the infantry were, and differing from those we had before in a number of small points, having among other things heavier bands and no Maynard primer. It was the best musket we ever had. If you're eager to see more of our historical documentaries, please like, share, and subscribe.